Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome is Christine Nielsen, and I am the MyNet Librarian for Manitoba Health, Seniors, and Active Living. Um, today, we're kicking off our fall um, webinar series with a special session on Manitoba. Um, thanks for coming. I hope you enjoy. Uh, we do have uh, a last minute change. Um, our speaker was Dr. Eric Baum, who is an orthopedic surgeon and professor of surgery at the University of Manitoba. Um, he has provincial responsibilities, the central intake, orthopedic standards and quality, and the provincial joint replacement registry. And he serves as the director of systems performance at the George and Faye Center for Healthcare Innovation and is the clinical sponsor for Choosing Wisely Manitoba. He is a busy guy. Um, unfortunately, he is running late today, so hopefully he'll be able to join us later. But not to worry, in the meantime, uh, we have another special guest. We have Sarah Kirby, uh, and Sarah leads the systems performance platform at the George and Faye Center for Healthcare Innovation with Dr. Eric Baum. And as part of their work, they support quality improvement projects and the implementation of evidence-based knowledge into the healthcare system. Now, along with Shared Health, Sarah supports the implementation of Choosing Wisely recommendations in Manitoba. So she's also an excellent speaker on this topic. Um, we are going to be monitoring the chat. Um, I imagine there will be time at the end, uh, hopefully, for some questions. Is that right, Sarah? That's correct, yep. Wonderful. Um, so I invite you to enjoy the presentation. and. Um, hopefully we'll have some, some good discussion towards the end. And I'm going to pass things over to Sarah. Take it away. Great. Well, thank you for that introduction. And thanks for this opportunity today to present to you uh, on Choosing Wisely. Um, sorry, my camera is not working. There's some sort of last minute glitch there. But uh, I'll just spend a little bit of time just introducing what Choosing Wisely is from a national point of view and what we're doing here in Manitoba and uh, then leave it open to some questions at the end. And Dr. Bo may join us at any point during this presentation. He is apologetic that he's been running, running behind today with some scheduling issues at his clinic. So just to start off with on our first slide here, um, Choosing Wisely is a campaign that's been around since about uh, 2014. And Haley, thanks for, yeah, thanks for moving those for me. It really uh, started as a very much of a clinician driven campaign with um, with the goal of uh, really improving um, appropriateness uh, of tests, treatments and procedures in Canada um, by in encouraging conversations with patients about appropriate care. Um, next slide. Uh, right now, choosing wisely. Uh, has expanded to uh, to countries all over the world. Um, in Canada, um, pretty much every province um, has a satellite office that supports Choosing Wisely Canada. Um, it's yeah, it's active in all 12 provinces and uh, the territories. There are currently over 350 recommendations on unnecessary tests and treatments, and we've partnered with over 70 professional societies. And those are the societies that come, come together to come up with the lists that you may know about. And those are a series of recommendations uh, that they put out, uh, their top five recommendations that they make to their own particular um, uh, specialty areas um, about the test treatment or procedures that they recommend um, that clinicians uh, stop doing. And we'll give some examples of those, but an example is MRI for low back pain, for example. It, it's recognized through evidence that MRIs for low back pain don't improve outcomes and they're very costly uh, and um, back up our system. So, um, radiology is encouraging uh, no MRI for low back pain. So moving on, um, well, I, this next slide I pretty much covered. Um, I talked about the recommendations and that these come from the different uh, specialty societies. Um, and moving on to the next slide. Uh, as I said, we have regional campaigns uh, across the country. 
Um, moving to the next slide, uh, I guess I really covered everything here in my opening uh, remarks on that other slide. So this is just an example of um, that each of these uh, of the specialties come up with their own recommendations. And if you go to the next slide, um, Haley, this is an example of what it would look like on the website. And they do have a great website. We'll share that with you um, uh, later on in the presentation. But you can see all the recommendations in, in the website from each uh, each of the specialty societies and they provide uh, all of the evidence uh, within each of these recommendations of how they came up with the recommendations. And of course, they're trying to use the highest level evidence possible, which are mostly the systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Um, so the first recommendation is one actually that Dr. Bohm was very involved uh, in developing. Uh, and that is that we know now that using arthroscopic uh, ar arthroscopy, which is basically scraping out of the knee, is not is not actually um, does not work as a treatment in the management of osteoarthritis of the knee. Uh, and yet, that's a popular. It's still a popular option that a lot of surgeons are using. So. Uh, the job sort of of us in our office is to help move along these recommendations. So we know that this isn't a isn't an effective treatment, but yet we still do it. And maybe a lot of you on this call um, recognize how hard it is to kind of move evidence into practice. And so that's partly what we do out of our office um, at, at the uh, Georgian Fahey Center for Healthcare Innovation. Um, okay, so uh, the next slide uh, that I think Haley had up a second ago, um, this sort of touches on what I was saying earlier. Um, some of the factors that lead to overuse, even though we might have evidence that that tells us, you know, no, that it, it's it's not necessary to do this test or it's or this particular procedure, it's costly. But what happens is we're a large machine, as you know, and once that machine is up and running to do something whether it's MRI for low back pain or whether it's uh, giving an antibiotic for something that's not necessarily uh, uh, requires an antibiotic, um, it's hard to reverse that. Sometimes it's the patient that wants it. Uh, sometimes it's just part of your practice. It's actually integrated into your, you know, your letter, your pre-op letters that you send out to your patients. Um, it may be just part of the way your practice operates. We found when we've gone in and examined uh, things uh, w using that pre-op example again, we found that uh, even though a family doctor knows that certain tests might not be necessary for a really basic small surgery, if the referring doctor wants that, then you're gonna send your patient for that test, like a chest X-ray for a minor surgery, which still happens. So uh, next slide. Um, then this, this slide just uh, um, talks about some of the consequences of doing unnecessary tests. Um, you can, you know, by, by engaging um, patients in more, I'll use the pre-op example again as another example, by sending patients for a full pre-op prior to a minor surgery, I mean, not only is it is it highly inconvenient and for the patient? Um, sometimes you can find things that are a, a false positive and then you get unnecessary anxiety. We, we've also been touching on a small project on um, kind of trying to take it easy with the amount of PSA testing we're doing because it is it does um, end up with a lot of false positives. And we had actually a urologist to come to us uh, to talk to us about how um, frustrating it is for him to see patients that had false positives and once you you go down that path it can it can create a lot of anxiety and can even have larger consequences if they end up doing a biopsy that that then has um, possible harm uh, fr from that um, and also this big issue of antimicrobial resistance um, the big part of our campaign is addressing the issues of overuse of antibiotics so just to quickly touch on who we are, uh, we are jointly uh, run from our office, as I mentioned, this is the Georgian Fahey Center for Healthcare Innovation, but also Shared Health, um, their quality uh, lead and uh, Lynette Siragusa, who is the provincial lead health systems integration and quality, um, is working um, to sort of lead this with Dr. Bohm. And so we work with uh, 
staff over at um, the diagnostic part of shared health. So that's really covering a lot of the overuse in lab testing. Um, and we do a lot of clinical practice changes and, and changes to order sets um, and trying to hard code, code change with the diagnostic service group. Um, and then over on our side, we have more of the clinical focus. So where we're trying to uh, integrate change uh, into the way the system operates and, and to actual clinical teams um, in the healthcare system. So we work very much together. And the next slide. So these are the ways that we support choosing wisely in Manitoba. As I talked about, we uh, support projects and initiatives. Now these are primarily brought to us by clinicians who um, may have uh, an, uh, may have sort of a pet peeve of theirs, uh, why are certain tests continually done when we know they don't um, improve care or when they could harm patients. And uh, so we do support that or quality improvement initiatives that cross over to choosing wisely recommendations. Um, we do participate in larger national and uh, provincial campaigns, so antimicrobial stewardship and antibiotic awareness, um, opioid awareness um, issues. Um, we do support resource stewardship in medical education, and I'll touch on that a little bit more um, about the types of work we're doing both in uh, the undergrad, postgrad, and resident uh, level, and continuing professional development with um, our clinicians. Um, and again, I mean, I touched on how we're supporting clinicians, but we also have an important part of our work, which is public and patient engagement, um, because this really is about conversations with patients and sometimes patients drive overuse or sometimes patients would like to not have a test, but feel pressured from, from their physician. So empowering patients and the public to know what to ask when they're having conversations with clinicians. So the next slide. This represents um, some of the toolkits that are available on the Choosing Wisely Canada website. Again, um, we'll give you the links to those, uh, but I believe it's just choosingwiselycanada.ca. Um, no, .org, choosingwiselycanada.org. And these toolkits are very helpful. Um, they give a lot of the evidence for why these uh, tests or treatments aren't are unnecessary and give you some step-by-step uh, -step guidance on how you might implement this um, in your hospital or in your care facility. And we've used some of these uh, to guide us in some of the work we've done in Manitoba. And so the next slide, uh, I think, is a representation of some of the work we've been doing over the last few years, specifically in Manitoba. So I did talk about the preoperative uh, testing here that um, we implemented a revised preoperative testing guidelines in Manitoba based on the most updated evidence um, and, the, and the most updated guidelines. So mainly it was to uh, you know, stop doing full workups for people with minor, uh, having minor surgery. Um, and we have all of the details of that campaign and the results and the evaluation results on our website, which is choosingwiselymanitoba.ca. Uh, um, also, we another uh, we've implemented new standard operating procedures. Uh, we're actually making this provincial. So we were one of the few provinces that continue to have to test all tissue. Um, if tissue was taken from a patient um, and now we're able to just dispose tissue without having to um, test, test it uh, and, and undergo unnecessary testing with all tissue samples. Um, we're working on projects, we're, we're rolling out the reducing the use of MRI for low back pain from a regional to a provincial campaign. Um, implementing re uh, revised provincial requisitions for fr free uh, T3 and T4. Um, we, we do have, yeah, we do have uh, um, some even updated from this presentation, uh, and I'll talk about a little bit later what we're doing about blood management, um, eliminating some of the testing going on in emergency departments based on current evidence, 
and um, some further um, further testing here around thyroid stuff. Um, okay, so the next slide, this is just an example then of some of the material that we produced for the low back pain, um, reducing MRI for low back pain. And this would be an example of a patient facing resource. So it helps the patient understand um, why maybe they're not being recommended to get an MRI. This is something that's very patient driven and very important to include patients in a process like this because when you're in a lot of back pain, you know, really getting an MRI feels like something concrete that you might be able to see what the problem is. And if you're suffering from really bad chronic back pain, it would could be very difficult to hear a message like, we're not going to give you an MRI for that because that can't help you. Uh, so it's very important that we get material out and educate patients um, around those kind of messages. The next slide represents an example of something that would be more of a clinician or clinical team facing um, uh, uh, resource that is. So Manitoba is one of the highest users of red blood cells um, and transfusing multiple units was common practice. So Shared Health worked really closely with Best Blood Manitoba to design and implement this Choosing Wisely recommendation to support restrictive transfusion protocols. And patient reassessment after each unit um, of blood is transfused in stable non-bleeding patients. And we, along with this, um, this uh, educational resource, we developed a clinical practice change that was released provincially, following, uh, followed up with a number of training sessions uh, delivered via WebEx for all clinical lab and support staff to learn more about the new protocol, the evidence behind it, and to review some case studies. And so the tools included with that clinical practice change guideline, um, or sorry, some of the tools included were the actual guideline itself, the new clinical practice guideline, posters, video, video presentation and case studies. And so we have rolled that this out and we are um, taking, just currently taking a look at um, the results of whether we have decreased the number of uh, the amount of transfusion um, as a result of the campaign. This is a campaign that um, has really had a lot more attention recently with COVID-19 and we've seen a lot of national discussion around blood use and um, maintaining our blood supply in Canada. So a lot more, um, a lot more probably campaigns going forward and practice changes going forward around blood product uh, use and, and uh, blood use. The next uh, slide is just uh, a, a little more detail on what I had spoke, uh, talked about earlier, which is um, the DROP, the pre-op project. It was the implementation of revised preoperative testing guidelines. And I did cover this earlier, so I, I won't go into too much detail here, but just like the Transfuse Wisely campaign, we uh, didn't just implement a new guideline. Um, as we know, uh, those of us in this field, and I know that many of you understand there's a lot of great evidence out there, but it's hard to get that into practice. So our um, knowledge translation strategies tell us that we need to do more than just implement guidelines. So we in, involved the key stakeholders uh, around the table uh, at the beginning of this process. Um, we went into um, clinics and looked at the types of cover letters and uh, history and physical forms they were using. And we found that a lot of uh, specialty offices were using very outdated cover letters. So we created a template to uh, suggested use so that they weren't encouraging people undergoing minor surgery to continue to get full um, pre-op uh, uh, tests done. So we, we developed a number of these um, of these template letters, we developed an app, it's a decision support aid that helps um, 
you to make a decision about whether that particular patient might need uh, more pre-op tests than, than uh, just the basic pre-op test, or whether they can get away with less preoperative testing. Um, and we uh, did find a 37% reduction in unnecessary tests. So this was a retrospective observational chart review um, of audits um, of a sample of surgical patients at two time periods. Okay, and the next uh, slide, and again, you can read more about that, including getting all the results uh, in the full, uh, full evaluation uh, on our website. So I had talked earlier about the fact that there are often national campaigns that then we would support locally. And two examples of that are the Opioid Wisely and the Using Antibiotics Wisely projects. And we work really closely with, the, um, with Choosing Wisely Canada, with our public health here in Manitoba, um, and the National Centre for Infectious Disease, uh, which happens to be um, located here in Manitoba as well. Uh, in, in order to broadly um, promote these campaigns and support them. And the next slide, uh, it just, again, is an example of a resource that we might push out. We usually um, push these resources out right around the Antibi uh, Antibiotic Awareness Week, which I believe is in um, October or November. Um, I'm just blanking on that right now, but uh, just trying to provide important information, not only to the clinicians, but again, this is one of those examples of where engaging patients in the public are so important because people don't necessarily understand the, what antibiotic resistance is, and they don't understand that some things that they may be, some conditions that they may be complaining about don't require antibiotics, but they just feel comfortable having a prescription. So, uh, I don't know if we have any examples of this here, but we what we've developed with Choosing Wisely Canada are prescription pads that actually give you a prescription. Uh, so the they're like a delayed prescription. So it's like go home, get some rest, drink lots, drink lots of fluid, and reassess this in a few days. If you really still feel like you need a prescription for antibiotic, we'll give you one. That's one example. Um, then there's other. Uh, prescription pads that basically just prescribe, um, you know, resting and fluids um, if, if the family physician does not feel like it is uh, an illness that requires an antibiotic or a cold, I should say, that requires an antibiotic. So the next slide, um, this just highlights the fact that another important part of the campaigns, both nationally and locally, is the concept of polypharmacy. So reducing um, inappropriate use of, um, of, of pharmaceuticals, not, not exactly inappropriate use, but um, there are some combinations of, uh, of drugs that are harmful or unnecessary. Um, and I forget exactly what the number is, but there, there, there's some um, really shocking number of medications that the average older adult is taking. And so just having a little bit more of an awareness of how we're prescribing. And, and again, with this, we work very closely with pharmacy. Um, the current Dean of Pharmacy is very interested in polypharmacy and addressing inappropriate use, and also the Canadian Deprescribing Network. So two of the campaigns uh, we focused on are reducing inappropriate use of benzodiazepine and sedative hypnotics among older adults in primary care and reducing inappropriate use of antipsychotics in long-term care. The next slide. Okay, so the next slide, we, we start to move into some of the work that we're doing um, at the medical education side uh, around resource stewardship. And so the idea here is, um, you know, we know that if we kind of bring, raise awareness uh, about this concept of resource stewardship at a young age and within the training, um, it, it's more likely to move forward with, um, with students as they become physicians and clinicians um, in various domains outside of medicine, even in pharmacy and nursing um, and dentistry, et cetera. So just, just raising awareness about the whole concept of resource stewardship and overuse. And um, 
students uh, and trainees advocating for resource stewardship are a group of uh, undergraduate medical students. They this started around 2014-2015 uh, and each year a new group of students, um, two students from every province in Canada are invited to participate in a national meeting where they talk about these concepts of resource stewardship and then they bring that forward to their medical school. And so uh, Dr. Bohm and I work uh, closely with our STAR students out of our office um, and encourage them to get involved in promoting the concepts of resource stewardship. And some of them have then moved on to do uh, projects related to that as they've moved along in medicine, including incorporating concepts of resource stewardship and choosing wisely within the undergraduate medical curriculum. And so the next slide shows that med medical students nationally have come up with their own um, recommendations for themselves. So six things that medical students and trainees should question um, in their, their training. And again, this is all available on our website. And this next slide, actually just is a really quick um, slide to talk about what one of our um, stars, a, a pair of our star students went on to do a project uh, to implement, um, as I mentioned earlier, concepts of choosing, uh, of resource stewardship and choosing wisely recommendations into pre-clerkship, uh, into the pre-clerkship curriculum. And um, they found that um, their awareness of the concepts um, increased after after they uh, got uh, got this material um, embedded a little bit more into um, their undergraduate curriculum. And then the next slide um, talks more about the work we're doing with postgraduate medical education. And um, just recently, um, Dr. Sikora, Abdi Sikora, who works with us, um, has really advocated for getting um, a resource stewardship uh, project and resource stewardship curriculum into postgraduate medical education. So now we finally um, move forward with, um, uh, so after getting sort of introduced to the concepts in undergrad, now there is a, a resource stewardship, a self-initiated project as part of postgraduate, um, the postgraduate curriculum. And it started already this year with um, within family medicine, and then it's being, un uh, it's going to unroll for other, uh, other specialties um, after this year. And so it is a required, um, a self-initiated project. Uh, for the postgraduate uh, students. And the next slide shows uh, that, uh, the, that there are resource stewardship uh, toolkits available uh, that have been developed in partnership with Choosing Wisely Canada and the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and the College of Family Physicians. Uh, and these are great toolkits. We've used them a lot. We, we have, um, with our with certain presentations that we've done with, with students. But again, lots of material, lots of work being done at the education level. Uh, so the next slide, this is a, a, an example of our uh, Choosing Wisely champions in Manitoba. Uh, these are champions on our website. And Andrea here, uh, you can see she actually started off as a student in, in the STARS program and um, getting involved in that, uh, implementing uh, the Choosing Wisely uh, recommendations into the curriculum. And now she's uh, continuing her work on um, uh, resource stewardship type projects as a, as a resident and has been really involved and really passionate about resource stewardship. So she's our most recent champion. But these are clinicians who have come to us with uh, with with issues and recommendations that they would really want to see implemented and again as many of you probably know it's really important to have a clinical champion or a champion that can help drive change it's sort of one of the important parts of uh, uh important components of of implementing change and so uh we try not to ever implement a change into our system without ensuring we do have a strong clinical champion to, uh, to support that moving forward. 
And so the next slide, we're getting into more of the public and patient facing work, more of the social marketing type uh, side of choosing wisely. And that is not so much my domain, but we have um, a great communication specialist, Haley Johnson, who is on the call today, and she is um, managing my slides. Thank you, Haley. And she's beautifully developed this uh, PowerPoint. Um, and so you may be familiar with this. This is sort of the, the uh, poster that most people recognize uh, represents Choosing Wisely Canada and their, their um, public facing work, which really pushes the concept of more is not always better. And I find this to be an, an excellent example. Uh, we also provide, uh, we have in Manitoba, this is a, a national um, campaign, this is the four questions to ask your doctor, but we've also taken these four questions and created them uh, little business cards to provide to patients and have really um, made this part of our patient facing um, or public facing work is to encourage patients to ask these questions when they're uncertain about a test or a procedure that they're being um, that that their physician may be asking them to to take um, and so we do um, sorry Haley next slide we do connect with the community quite regularly we we do um, go to different events uh, so we're not we're not just connecting with clinicians I mean we do go to a lot of clinical specialty events that. Um, and, and nursing events, and, and, and we do have a lot of clinician-facing material, but we also uh, have booths that um, with, with the, with the uh, general public in Manitoba and, and attend events that the public, and speak in events that the public attends. So we have a lot of patient-facing resources on our website that you can, you can look at um, that we do provide at these resources. Um, and these are, this is a uh, next slide, Haley, is just some of the uh, examples of um, comments that we've received from patients um, just talking about why they're resistant um, to talking to their doctor um, and, and some ideas they have for us to, to um, help them to be able to have these conversations with doctors. So, and I, and I agree with some of these, some of this is how I feel uh, as well, even uh, you, you maybe don't want to challenge your doctor, et cetera. So we are working with patients and the public to, we're not just, you know, going out there and telling them, make sure you, you know, challenge your physician or challenge, you know, ask questions at your doctor's appointment. We we're really listening to them to hear, well, it's not that easy. So what can we do to support that conversation? Uh, the next slide, uh, I did talk about this a bit here. We have a lot of patient facing resources available and I find these really great. They try to um, simplify some of the recommendations. Um, and so if people, for example, th this provides some information about why you may not be getting an antibiotic for a certain, uh, to treat certain conditions. The first one there is urinary tract infection in older people. Um, and so it just provides more information for the patient to kind of understand the context um, because it might be upsetting if you're not uh, receiving a test that you think you, you should have. The next slide, um, now this delayed prescription is something I was alluding to before. Um, I was talking about it in the terms of antibiotics. Um, and and this is a uh, this is one example of a delayed prescription that we use, and the other resource on here is um, again uh, um, uh, an example from that list on the previous slide. When you click on each of those links, you'll get what the patient-facing resource is, and the and the picture on the left there is the patient-facing resource for the low back pain. Uh, um, no MRI for low back pain or reducing it. It's not, it's sometimes you do require an MRI, but um, just if, you, if you're not getting an MRI for low back pain, this is an option that the phys physician can provide to the patient, just describing in a little more detail why and what they can do to help mitigate that pain um, and what kinds of decisions go into 
um, whether or not you require an MRI. And the next uh, slide is an example of our website. So that's the Choosing Wisely Manitoba .ca website. And we um, have a new updated website that's full of um, resources. You can link to the Choosing Wisely Canada website from our website. You can link to us. You can see all about our different initiatives, details about the initiatives. A lot of results are posted. Um, if you want to see results, uh, you can just email us if, if things aren't um, posted on the website or we just have executive summaries in some cases. Um, the next slide uh, talks about um, our Twitter presence. So this is our more of our social marketing presence. And Haley is really great at getting us out there and connecting us. Um, as some of us on the team don't tweet as much as we should. And uh, it, definitely Choosing Wise of Canada has a lot of Twitter presence. And so um, in Manitoba, we, we do as well. And um, that is it. That is our presentation. That gives you a very high level um, overview of what we're about in each one of those domains and each one of those projects. I could probably do an entire presentation just to describe one project, like um, the uh, Transfuse Wisely project or the pre-op uh, reducing unnecessary preoperative testing. Uh, mo many of these projects are hours and hours and, and, and months and years, in some cases, of work. Um, we try to evaluate um, as much as possible. We try to use data and evaluate our work. Um, it's not always possible to do that, or it's not always possible to do that with the greatest rigor, depending on resources, but we, we, we try to do that, which takes time and commitment. Uh, and so, um, Many of these projects are ongoing, uh, and some of them are just smaller quality improvement um, um, cycles that we we work with clinicians to do. So we're happy to. Um, I may not be able to speak to each project today, but you can email us at any time, and I'm happy to take questions at any point. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was very informative. Um, we do have a, a question that came in through the chat. Um, so I'll just read that out. Um, if anyone else wants to ask a question through the chat, you have the opportunity to do that as well. Um, so this particular question was, um, shouldn't you have a pharmacist on the core team if significant aspects of choosing wisely initiatives are drug related? And that, I think that refers to uh, a slide you had earlier uh, in the presentation that kind of discussed who, who all the different players are. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, we have an advisory committee uh, of people um, that help to guide the work we do in Manitoba. And currently, we do have um, Lalitha Raman Wilms, who is the Dean of Pharmacy on that team. Um, now, we, if we are to do any pharmacy related projects, uh, we would be have a, a pharmacist as a clinician champion on that team we would never take on a pharmacy project with without involving pharmacy absolutely nationally um there are a lot of pharmacists around the table guiding decision making around um around that and i'm blanking on who the national um person is right now uh on that team but uh you're absolutely right. And so from a high level direction, we, we have uh, Lalitha as an advisor, um, but we would have a pharmacist on the team for specific projects. So the team that I gave you the overview of like Dr. Bohm and myself and Lynette, and uh, we're just sort of the doers. We're the, we're the ones that kind of help move it along, but we, uh, we don't drive the projects and we don't make the decisions about what projects we should do. That's really driven a lot more by by the clinicians in Manitoba. Great, thanks. Um, well, while while we wait for more questions to come in, I actually have a question for you. Um, you've got all these these different groups that are are um, gathering and evaluating and synthesizing evidence to come up with these recommendations. Um, and choosing wisely has been around for Quite a few years now so I was just wondering um, if you if you could say uh, anything about 
how often um, those recommendations are revisited. Like, is there a schedule or is it kind of like, well, you know, we'll just kind of see how things go and then we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Okay. Um, I, I assume it's, it's a little less laissez-faire, but <laughs> I, was, I, I thought I would ask. Yeah, you know what, that's a really good question. Um, these recommendations are very society driven. And in fact, some have only recently come up with their list of five or 10, so some have have more than five, but five is the, the minimum. Mm -hmm. um, and from my observation in those lists, very few of those have been ticked off. So I would think uh, that maybe the revisiting would happen as they start to achieve more, I mean, it's a slow process. It, it's unbelievable. And where some areas of the country have made some progress, other areas really haven't. Uh, so I, I don't think the cycle of revisiting it is very, um, it's not a short cycle, uh, but it's a good question. We haven't had to revisit yet because we've just been encouraging people to come up with the lists to begin with. But um, I, I think that this would probably be handled at the national uh, level. And that's a really good question that I might actually bring up with them. But again, my observation on looking at the lists is, you know, a lot of the lists uh, still, we're still doing a lot of those things, even though a, rec a, list, a, a recommendation list may have been out for several years. It's not as simple as just, hey, we recommend you don't, you know, provide an antibiotic for a viral cold. Um, that doesn't really matter. <laughs> it still happens quite a bit. And so uh, I think there's still a lot of work being done on just those first recommendations. Okay, fair enough. Okay, we have another question that's come in through the chat. Um, and it says, would it be possible to create a portfolio, um, and then in brackets it says, relevant information for midwives? Uh, we are primary healthcare providers. However, our field crosses over other disciplines, um, obstetrics, pediatrics, family medicine, etc. I would love to have access to the uh, the RX, the prescription mentioned. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. You know, I'm going to answer that question by quickly using the internet. I feel like I've seen a list. I've seen something about midwives somewhere. I'm just so what I'm doing is actually going to the Choosing Wise in Canada site and typing um, this into their, uh, their recommendation search. So it, it's, I, have, I found something that says promoting best practices in women's health, the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecologists of Canada. And they um, include midwives in their list of uh, groups of people. Um, that this these recommendations would target um, and yeah uh, I don't see a list of recommend oh the first two uh, rec top yeah yeah they do have a top 10 recommendation list now this may not be midwives specifically but um, it looks like midwives are included in this uh, top 10 list so how I found this is going on to choosing wisely can oh and they they have evidence associated with it too that's great um, I went on to choosing wisely Canada site and I typed midwives into their recommendation list so they have all their recommendations um, listed um, so that you can search it on and then all the evidence behind those are all located inside. Um, within the Choosing Wisely Canada website. And then the second question you had about uh, having a copy, I think you of one of the resources, I think that was the question. Um, uh, you can just, it was a copy of the prescription? Um, uh, yeah, it's access to the uh, to the prescription mentioned. Um, I yeah, think. The, delayed, the delayed prescription. I believe that's on our website. Haley, are you able to um, unmute and answer that? I think you can just access that on our website or you can contact us at after and we can, we can provide that to you. Yeah, I can put my email in the chat box. Um, are, are, Christine, is everyone able to see the chat box when I put? Um, they should be able to see the chat box for sure. Okay. Um, so, it, in in some cases it might be collapsed, but there's there would be a little uh, arrow uh, beside chat, and if if they click on that, then it should open. And I see that Dr. Bohm has joined us. 
So um, yes, so hi, sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm waiting. Thank you, Haley and Sarah, for initiating here. I'll just finish up quickly. So I put my email in there. If anyone is interested in any of our resources or has any questions or anything, feel free to email me and we can get some stuff out to you and get your questions answered. That's awesome. Great. Um, we have another question that's in the chat and I'll just read it out. Um, so it says, well, sorry, it's in the questions, it's not in the chat. Um, the list of champions you highlighted on the webpage is pretty Winnipeg centric. I know that there uh, are initiatives in Southern Health championed by local radiologists on, um, I think, uh, imaging local GP pharmacists on antimicrobial stewardship, uh, the no prescription pads. Uh, should a provincial organization be more geographically inclusive? Um, so I don't, do you have any kind of comments on that? Yeah, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think that when we got started, I mean, we all kind of do doing this off the corner of our desk. So we were kind of just jumping on to uh, what we have referred to at the beginning as low hanging fruit. And that is uh, champions that came to us and were really eager to push things forward. And we haven't made an effort to be necessarily be geographically inclusive, even though we have worked uh, on campaigns exclusively outside of Winnipeg. Um, but you, you bring up a really good point. And we, we have now, um, do have champions outside of Winnipeg. And it, it really being a provincial organization and a provincial campaign, we should be focusing on champions outside of, of Winnipeg now that we've sort of got our legs under us and, and we're moving along here um, with our work. Okay, great, thank you. Um... We'll just kind of pause for uh, a couple more minutes in case there are other questions that people want to submit. Um, yeah, so um, I guess I was I was just kind of wondering since you guys have been involved with uh, choosing wisely uh, for a while now. Um, I guess I don't know if if you're fielding these kinds of questions, but I guess what, what, what do you find um, to be the most rewarding about working with such a program? Well, personally, and I, I don't know uh, if Eric wants to jump in and talk about what's rewarding for him. Um, for me, I, I am really excited by the, just the enthusiasm. I, I, it seems that you know, most clinicians we work with really agree with and uh, these recommendations, they, they're behind them 100%. And what we help with out of our office anyways is just change is complicated and, and hard. And it's not that people don't want to change or it's not that clinicians aren't eager to change. It's that they, we need to facilitate that change with some support. And so I, I just find it really um a fun to work with the different groups uh, and and have seen you know not a lot of resistance to change but just like to be able to provide that support and to look at ways we can be creative and innovative in the way we can push along um, implementing these recommendations. Eric, do you want to add to that yeah. at all? Hi, it's Eric. Thanks again, Sarah and Haley, for pitching in. And sorry, I was late. I have a fractured clinic that uh, exceeded my wildest expectations. So, um, so I think that in the choosing wisely um, environment, you meet a lot of people that are really dedicated to improving healthcare delivery and sustaining our um, our healthcare system. And I think you know we can all think of examples of how we could do things better in healthcare system. And really, the, the challenge is not figuring out what we need to do better, but the challenge really is making it happen. And I think the choosing wise GNC to really gets, gives you a set of tools and a, and a way to engage people and organizations to make those kinds of changes. So I think that's, I think that's what's, um, what's satisfying for me. Um, and, you know, and then they're so engaged and it's so Canadian and it's so international. I really think it's a strong tool for driving positive change in a healthcare system. Great. Thank you, thank you for your comments. Um, I, I mean, as as kind of an outsider, I think this kind of program is pretty inspiring, um, and I totally recognize, like you say, change is hard. I don't think I don't think it matters what what area you're working in. Any kind of change is difficult. Um, well, I do have another uh, 
comment in the in the, the questions. Um, so uh, one of our participants is wondering how they can get involved. Um, you might have mentioned it earlier, but uh, they, they, they would have missed it. One way to get involved is just to contact us. Um, and we can chat about you know what what your passion is or what what it is that you are interested in in implementing or changing and uh we sort of go from there um and if there's yeah or there may be other ways you want to be involved uh and and it'd be we love hearing from people so yeah give us a yeah and i would just add that um you know these choosing wisely initiatives um require a champion obviously we can't do all of this on our own so um, if you have ideas that align with choosing wisely get engaged with um your groups choosing wisely recommendations your national associations choosing wisely recommendations and generating new recommendations and certainly if you have an idea and and um, would like to be a champion for that to uh to move it forward, we can certainly offer some assistance uh, with those efforts. Great. So we have we have a couple more minutes. If anybody else wants to ask a question, um, I did notice that Haley has put um, some links in the chat. Um, so for the the specific. Um, question about about uh, for midwives the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecologists of Canada there's a link to their the recommendation there um, and then she's also got her her email as well um, I will point out that uh, if anybody uh, wants to revisit the presentation or if you if you enjoyed it so much you want to recommend it to all your friends it, it is being recorded and it will be available on the MyNet website um, so you can uh, access it at a later time again as well. Okay, so um, yeah, I guess are there any any kind of final thoughts that, uh, that you guys would like to leave with us? So I, I sort of just one other thing to add from my perspective is um, you know part of the work that we're trying to do is really try to change the culture around. Um, healthcare delivery and, and appropriate tests, interventions and treatments, um, and fostering discussions between patients and providers around those things. And we've engaged the undergraduate medical uh, curriculum and the postgraduate medical curriculum, as I know Sarah uh, spoke about in her presentation. So certainly, you know, keeping that message up um, as you interact with uh, physicians, surgeons, residents, and, uh, and medical students. Uh, and you know, pharmacy students, nursing students, allied health students, I think it's helpful as well. So I would just one sort of final thought there. Okay, great, thank you. How about you, Sarah or Haley? I, I don't think I have anything to add. I did a lot of talking, but Haley, maybe you have uh, something you want to add to that. I think the only thing I'd like to add is that we would love to hear from you if, if you have questions, if you have ideas, if you're if you're passionate about this and there's any part of you that heard our presentation and feels like you want to get involved, please reach out to us. You can contact me at my email. You can do, I've put up the contact us page. We want to hear from you if, if you're passionate about this and we'd love to hear from you. Okay, great. Well, thank you again. Um, we really appreciate that you guys made the time to to do this presentation. Um, sorry that the scheduling didn't quite work out for you, Dr. Bohm. Um, I guess, Dr. you know, <laughs> it's, it's one of those I've days. I've never ran this later in fact, clinic before, so it was a surprise to, to everybody. Again, my apologies. Not a, not a problem. We understand. Um, yeah, so, you know, and, um, oh. So I've got another question. Late breaking question has come in. Um, oh, okay. So someone uh, is joining by phone, so they don't have access to the chat. So I'm just gonna I'll, I'll note you down, um, and I will um, I should have your email from when you you registered, and I will I will send those items to you. I can't I can't write and talk at the same time, so it's it's a little quiet for a second here. Okay. 
Okay, great. Well, thanks again, um, and thank you to the folks who uh, who joined in today. Um, and I wish you all a good afternoon. Great. Thank Take you. care. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you.